I welcome all of you to the Institute for Spirituality and Health. And uh, it's going to be a wonderful lecture we're going to hear in just a minute, a talk, and we'll hear from Helen in just a moment. I want to mention to you that there are some handouts in the back that may be of interest to you. A list of all the talks that will be taking place there. Um, then a Save a Day card for three lectures in particular. We have uh, one lecturer that's uh, worthy of your interest, I think. Uh, his name is Gerald Schroeder coming up. Uh, he's from Israel. He's an MIT trained physicist who's also a biblical scholar. Has a very uh, interesting way to put together the first uh, chapter of Genesis as well as his modern findings in physics. And I read two of his books. One of them is The Hidden Face of God very uh, outstanding book I recommend it as well as The Science of God so he's got a lot of really neat stuff and he'll be here next Wednesday at noon that's on leap year so it's the 29th of February I'll be here at noon time and you can register uh, if you would like to do come and be a part of that we have some other lectures coming up that you can uh, learn about by reading that we're just delighted to have Helen here Anne Marie Wallace, where's Anne Marie? Back yeah, here. Yeah. Oh, you've got to have Helen come speak. Uh, she's professor of sociology at the University of Houston. As most of you know, she received her PhD degree in sociology from Columbia. Um, she specialized at that time in organizational psychology and the psychology of religion. Um, she has five research monographs, two edited books, numerous scholarly articles in print. She has served as president of the National Association for Sociology of Religion and helped organize and served as the first chair of the American Sociological Association section on sociology of religion and is past president of the Society for Scientific Study of Religion. She made one of those trips to Turkey that some of you have made, my wife made, and uh, sort of touched her heart and she began to learn about the Gulen movement. So we're going to have the joy of hearing about that and I welcome all of you, particularly those of you that are from that wonderful institution. I've been blessed by being a part of the, the Institute for Interfaith Dialogue. Thank you for coming and being here and welcome Helen. Let's give her a warm welcome. telling John I had some contact with the Institute of Religion and it was still by that name but I've always kind of been interested in what's happened after it changed its name and whatever so I'm very happy to be here and um, I'm glad to see for example Dr. Parkman here we've known each other a long time Triple SR in various other ways and a lot of my friends from the New Land Movement uh, two people in particular I'm going to have to recognize as we talk about this book. My husband, Albert, who went with me for all the interviews that went into this, and uh, Dr. Aslan Juan, who really set them up and gave me the idea to begin with. So I thought what I would do today, um, since some of you know nothing about the Gulen movement, I understand, or very little, I feel that I have to spend the first uh, 10 or 15 minutes giving you background on the movement, and then I'm going to talk about my latest work, which is tracing the movement globally. That's what I'm into right now, sort of global religious service movements. So that's what I want to talk about um, at the end, and then leave plenty of time for questions. OK. Um, I think it's very interesting. I really noticed this today. Uh, I haven't shared this with Dr. Aslan yet, but he really had the idea for this book. We thought it was going to be very different when we did the interview. So I give him a lot of credit. Um, I got word today from Springer that this, this one, the Turkish one, has now sold 60,000 copies. Wow. And that shows you the interest of the movement in Turkey, and also that it's very controversial. And I want to touch on that also. And I think it's interesting. When I chose the cover for this book, this is Mr. Gulan who started the movement, and this is the Bosphorus, and the bridge 
that unites East and West. So I thought this was very significant because part of the movement is um, interfaith and intercultural dialogue between East and West. But when they picked the cover for the Turkish edition, they really featured Mr. Gulen because they say any time you write a book on Mr. Gulen in Turkey, it's going to be a bestseller. So I really noticed that today as I was thinking about this. So let me say a little bit about the movement first for those of you that uh, are not at all familiar with it. It's an interfaith, it's a um, civic movement, a non-political movement that began in Turkey in the late 60s and the 1970s. And it was begun by an imam, M. Fatula Gulen, who now lives in Pennsylvania. And he started preaching in the mosques and coffee houses and street corners and anywhere anybody would listen to him. And his basic message was that it was very important to address some of the ills that he saw in Turkey at the time, um, particularly poverty, ignorance, and uh, strife among groups. And um, he was very concerned about the youth because there were a lot of youth movements in Turkey at that time trying to garner the hearts and minds of the young people. Uh, nationalistic movements, socialist movements, uh, communist movements, movements of all sorts. And people, you know, many young people were caught in these crossfires. And he was very concerned about that. His basic message was that um, it was critical to educate the youth. But he said, we don't need madrasas, these, these um, schools that you know, teach Islam and, and are very closed. He said, what we need are schools that will teach education, democracy, um, technology, and skills that these people will need in the modern age for the 21st century. And especially, he wanted to wed education with basic human values. He was very concerned about a value-based education, along with the kind of education that would emphasize um, math, science, technology, democracy. He began preaching in Izmir, which for those of you who have been, is one of the um, business industrial cities in Turkey, in the uh, Aegean region, and people began to get interested in his ideas, and particularly some of the businessmen. And he said over and over again, to carry off this agenda, we're going to need everybody involved. We're going to need teachers, and we're going to need administrators, and we're going to need <coughs> businessmen who can provide the money to accomplish these uh, endeavors. And some of the businessmen got very intrigued with this idea. He was also emphasizing free trade, um, a lot of, of values that appealed to them. So they put up money, the original money, and the first thing that happened was um, the group began to open summer camps where the young people could come where they could both um, learn about Islam, but also learn some of these skills and values that were so important to Mr. Gulen. At, the, at that time, there were, um, all the schools in Turkey were, were public. So he began saying that um, what was also needed were dormitories, where people could send their young people to live while they attended particularly uh, secular high schools and universities, and where the young people would be in a safe environment and would be tutored at the same time, especially by university uh, students. And remember at this time, there was also a rural to urban movement in Turkey, and a lot of people were nervous about sending their young people to the cities because they were afraid of these movements that they could be caught up in. So in these dorm, many people thought these dormitories would be a safer environment. So he, the businessmen began supporting and they began to set up these dormitories. 
And the, the third thing was, as you know, Turkey, like a lot of European countries, require a uh, university exam of all seniors uh, in high school. And at that time, there were some preparatory schools being offered, but the rate of people being accepted into university was very low, below 25%. So Mr. Gulen said, we also need to open up quality prep schools where these high school people can be um, tutored to do well on the university exams. So these prep schools were open. And before too long, the students in these prep schools began get scoring very well and getting into major universities in Turkey and also abroad. So before too long, the movement gained a momentum. People became more and more and more interested in the movement. Um, also about this time, he began saying that in addition to uh, these programs, there, there must be an emphasis in the, on the media, on, on sharing through the media some of these basic values. And that's when the rather large media empire that we see today began developing in terms of uh, first a magazine for the teachers and then ultimately led to the creation of Zaman newspaper in uh, Istanbul, which is the most widely read newspaper today in Turkey. And it's all over the world. You have an Australian Zaman, and you have an uh, English Zaman, and everywhere I go, I see editions of Zaman. Now, about this time now, remember, we, let's, let's fast forward to 1989, the fall of the Soviet Union. And um, at that point, Mr. Gulen also, remember in the 80s, President Ozal was president in Turkey. And he was very important to this story because besides emphasizing you know, free trade and market um, factors, he began to um, allow, for the first time, the creation of private schools. And that's when Mr. Boulan began saying, now we have the mechanism to begin to open schools that are inspired by the movement. So there were the, the, uh, two schools opened uh, very early in, in, in uh, the 90s, and at high schools first. And today, the movement is often known by its schools. We don't know exactly how many, and I can talk about that later, why numbers are so hard to give you. But we think there are about 500 hmm. in Turkey, and at least 500, if not more, around the world now. So these schools are becoming very important to the movement. Now, they're private schools. But they follow the state curriculum. Um, they teach no Islam, really. I think what's allowed is one week during the, the one hour during the week, they're allowed to teach religious studies of some sort. And they usually teach some kind of interfaith uh, curriculum. Now, the schools are known for their quality. It didn't take too long when word got out in Turkey. These are good schools. They emphasize math, they emphasize science, and Pat, where's Pat? Here. You've been to some of the schools, I bet, when you went with the IID. I don't know if you were as impressed as I was. But, oh my gosh, you walk into these schools and the quality of education was just incredible. You go into the science labs and they're just state of the art. And then many of these students were competing in these international science Olympiads and coming back with all these trophies. So every school you go into, you see all these trophies in the lobby representing uh, these uh, <coughs> Olympiads. So word got around in Turkey that these really, really were good schools. And that a lot of the students were you know, getting into good universities and whatever. So they began growing in various uh, parts of Turkey. Now, I'm asked all the time what makes them so good and what makes the land inspired uh, schools good wherever they are. I think a big um, answer to that is teachers. I was so impressed with the, some of these teachers that I met when you go into the schools. Um, you know, many of them stay after school and tutor. And, uh, and this happens everywhere. I know I was in Azerbaijan a 
couple of years ago, a year and a half ago. And I was there at 8 o'clock at night, and there were teachers in the classrooms preparing these kids for these science Olympiads, and you see that all the time. And one of the requirements is that once a semester, uh, the teacher visits the home of every student in the classroom. So there's a lot of emphasis on parental involvement. Uh, the schools, the language is English, so you go through the halls and you see English words everywhere. Uh, beautifully done posters that, you know, as a way of teaching the, the students English. Uh, so the schools began growing throughout uh, Turkey. Another thing was my husband is a physician and we went into some of the private hospitals. And I remember Albert, you remarked, they have some equipment there. At that point, we didn't even have it at the Texas Medical Center. I mean, just incredible state-of-the-art equipment. And uh, really, you know, good hospitals. So in addition to the schools, the hospitals, and the media, and then one of my favorite things is um, Kimsey Youngblood, the relief organization. Uh, in Istanbul. After the earthquake, when was that? 1999? There, there was an earthquake in outside of Istanbul and um, a very bad earthquake. And the um, Samanyolu TV, which is inspired by the movement, began running a series on this little girl that, that the relief uh, people found, and she was crying in Turkey, Kimse Yahmu, which means something like, can, can no one help me? Can anyone help me? So they ran this series and to collect money, and it was so successful that out of that came this nonprofit organization, which is just wonderful. It's the first time um, that I saw this technique. I think now it's become common. But you know, you could see all of this on the TV, and then you could dial up your cell phone, and, and the cell phone companies, you could make a commitment, and they would charge that on your cell phone bill. I thought that was so clever. And you go into a lot of the schools, not only the Gulen inspired schools, you go into the streets, and you see these uh, boxes where they're collecting pennies for the victims of uh, disasters. It didn't take too long, and it went beyond the earthquake, and now we can see that who helps victims you know, in disasters all over the world. Um, when I was in, oh, I forget where I was. I was in so many different places. Um, uh, out that place, that Mudanya, exactly. we went by boat. Remember, we saw these guys that had just come back from Darfur. Was that my trip with you? I've been seven times. I think <laughs> six or seven times, so I forget which is which. They had just come back from Darfur, and they had they had they had gotten forty head of cattle, and they were distributing them um, to the people in the village after um, <coughs> Hajj, and uh, they had made a commitment to this village that within two years they would totally rebuild the village. They were so excited about what they were doing for Darfur. They had already built three schools in Turkey, and now this was going to be their next project. Anyway, that's just some of what the movement does. Now, why? That's always one of the big questions. Why do people do this? And when we started this project, that was my question. I came back after that and I said, where's the money coming from? This takes a lot of money. Who's behind this? And the critics were saying, it's Saudi Arabia. It's Iran. It's the CIA. So when we, when we started this project, the idea was to interview people in Turkey about to see if we could find out where the money's coming from. Well, let me just tell you, I'll go to the bottom line, and then I'll back up. Um, there's almost no government money going into this movement. A little bit sometimes in areas like in Azerbaijan, the government gave them some land and a building that was so dilapidated they had to tear it down and build another one. So maybe some things like that, but very, very little government money. It's coming from the people. Uh, Alp, you remember that first night? In, I'll never forget that first night in Istanbul when we met with these uh, 
some of the people who knew Mr. Goulin, one of them, no, three of them had put up the money for that hospital in Istanbul. And uh, what, what we came to realize, we started with that group, and then we interviewed um, blue collar workers, we interviewed professional people, engineers, we interviewed doctors at the hospital, we interviewed teachers, and we went all, we, we interviewed um, blue collar workers, and we did it, uh, uh, I did, Al didn't go with me on this one, it was all women, I interviewed a group of women uh, who were part of the movement, and it was just wonderful, and what we learned basically is that everybody, somewhere between 5 and 20 percent of their income. Now for some of these, you know, businessmen who make millions, that's a lot of money. And even poor uh, blue collar workers who could barely put food on the table were giving about 10 percent of their income. And this goes for scholarships in the schools. About 20 percent of the students in these schools uh, can't afford tuition, and they're private schools, so the students pay tuition. But these scholarships from the people in the movement uh, allow people who can't afford the tuition to go. And uh, the scholarships provide dormitory space, and they provide scholarships for people in these prep schools and whatever. So the giving on the part of everybody in the movement, in part, that's what makes the people so committed, as you know. Once you give, it's circular. You kind of feel committed. <clears throat> so it both builds commitment as well as shows commitment. So that's the money aspect. And why? Why do people do this? Well, I think the basic answer goes back to Turkish culture and to Islam. It's a religious movement. People are motivated by um, Islamic teachings and by Turkish culture which has always emphasized, as you know, hospitality. You have to come visit my home and see the beautiful cabinet I have with all these gifts. <coughs> Sweetheart, we're going to have to buy another cabinet. I'm already out of space. Mm -hmm. Every time you go to Turkey, you better take an extra suitcase because you're going to come back with ceramics. And, and these aren't just cheapy little things. I mean, these are beautiful ceramics. And anyway, so everybody gives. It's the spirit of Turkey, and it's the spirit of Islam. And they tell the story about, you know, Muhammad um, in the desert, never eating alone. When he would sit down at night, he would invite the stranger to his tent. And uh, so that has come down, and, and I think that's, that's part of it. So the movement is really a voluntary movement supported by the members. Now, we can go back to a lot of this. But let, the, let me talk a little bit about what I'm learning um, as the movement spreads uh, around the world. It's now, we don't know how many people, but probably eight to 10 million at least, and growing every day. That's one reason you can't count it. Uh, there's no membership lists. There are no lists of contributions. So it drives social scientists crazy. You want hard data. It's, you can't get it. It's impossible. So you just kind of have to piece together what you can. It's also a movement that has no bureaucracy. Uh, there's no central office. There's no Vatican. Oh, I did work in the Vatican about 25 years ago. It was wonderful because you could call up an office and say, you know, send me, fax me these tables. And you would have gorgeous tables. Now, they may not mean a lot, <laughs> but they sure can produce the data. <laughs> In the Gulen movement, there's no Vatican. There's no hierarchy. It's very much a network society. It's, it's networks, that's all I can tell you. In every country I've been, and, and um, uh, one scholar calls it the conglomerate <coughs> of networks, that's about right. And people in the movement don't even know one another. Some do. It, the movement spreading through the Turkish diaspora. So some people have gone to university together in Turkey, or their families know one another, or they grew up together. But other than that, uh, some of you may remember when I went to Spain last summer, 
I called up, I think I called up Mr. Shandir and I said, I'm going to Spain and I'd like to interview somebody in Madrid because I knew they had a dialogue society. And he said, Dr. Ebal, I don't know anybody in Spain. You know, he's kind of like, why should I? I said, you're in the same movement. He said, but I know, I have a friend in Istanbul who has a friend who used to live in Madrid. So that way, I got a name and an email. But that's how it is. And I go to these other countries. Sometimes they know people in Houston. Sometimes they don't. So it's, it's, it's networked, but it's very non-hierarchical. Now, um, in the late 80s, uh, Mr. Gulan, uh, besides encouraging the schools, also said, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, there's going to be a vacuum in a lot of these former Soviet countries, like Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, all the states. And he said, there are going to be movements coming in fighting for the minds and hearts of the young people. So he said, it's time to start schools in these countries. The first school outside of Turkey started in Azerbaijan in 1992. It's a wonderful story because one of these wealthy businessmen who was listening to Mr. Newland, one of his early supporters, sold everything he had, bought this old rickety van, put his family in there in a few possessions, and had uh, headed to Azerbaijan. And he happened to meet a education minister there who caught his attention, was interested in him, and I interviewed that minister in uh, Azerbaijan. And they started the first school. There are now, I think it's 12 schools or 15 schools in Azerbaijan, and nine dialogue societies. And there's also a university. So. Uh, that was Azerbaijan. Well, shortly thereafter, within a year, the school started in, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, I think, or Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan, and then it just spread. And today, it's we we know there are about a hundred. We know there are over 120 countries and over a thousand schools. They're on five continents. I mean, this movement is growing. It's growing very rapidly in Africa. Um, I interviewed in, in um, Istanbul with the head of the uh, Kainat Corporation, one of the big media conglomerates inspired by the movement in uh, Turkey. And he had just gotten back from Africa. And he said they're now in every country in Africa. He was so excited about Africa. Well, I have a wonderful purse from Ghana made out of uh, iguana hide. <laughs> but anyway, he had just gotten back from uh, Africa. Now, I've interviewed in uh, Azerbaijan. I've interviewed in Melbourne, Australia. I've interviewed in Brussels, Copenhagen, uh, London, Spain. Let's see where else. At least those countries. In next month, I'm going to Germany. My book has just come out in German, Arabic, and. Um, Hungarian. Anyway, it's just now coming out in German, so I'm going to go through some lectures in Germany. And then this summer, I think I'm going to uh, Ireland, to Dublin and to Northern Ireland. So anyway, here's some things I'm noticing. Um, first of all, the movement spread through the Turkish diaspora. It's still a Turkish movement. Now, whether it's going to stay that way, who knows? Because more and more people in these countries are getting very interested in what the people are doing in the movement. But it's, it's still very much through the Turkish uh, diaspora. That's one reason I'm objecting and I'm in a little tiff with the people in the movement who insist that it be called the Hizmet Movement, which is what Mr. Gulen first suggested. He doesn't like the name the Gulen Movement because it, he's a very humble person. I've never met him and won't because can't you just see the media uh, with their flashbulbs photographing me with Mr. Gulan? It ruins my objectivity. <coughs> I'm a social scientist. People say, are you for the movement or against the movement? I said, neither. I'm an objective social scientist who's after data. Give me data. <laughs> anyway, um, so many the movement has been known inside the movement as the Hizmet movement. 
Now, when I travel around the world, people will say, what? I was in a hotel in Spain this past summer, and I said to the desk clerk, I said, hey, have you ever heard about the Hizmet movement? What? I said, the Gulen movement. He said, oh, yeah, yeah. I went to one of their Ramadan dinners. I know that. And I was in uh, Melbourne. And the same thing, I said to a taxi driver, you know, I'm, I'm studying the Hizmet. What? what? Where's that? What's that? How do you spell it? And I said, you know the Gulen movement? He said, oh, yeah, we know the Gulen people. So this word, Hizmet, it's got to go for several reasons. One is, Outside the movement, it's a very in-groupish word, and it's very Turkish. And if the movement's going to move internationally, it's got to, you know, be known by the, as, as the Gulen movement. Secondly, there's a scholarly literature now on the Gulen movement. You know, we all use um, Andy. What's that thing called? We use where you see what people have published. System tenure. What tenure. <laughs> tenure, that's one of them. And promotion. Oh, uh, citation index. You go to the citation index and you put, type in the Hizmet movement, you may get a few little stray things, but you type in the Gulen movement and you've got heavyweights. So if it's going to make a scholarly contribution, it's got to use the Gulen movement because that's the way it's being known worldwide. And it's the way it's being known in scholarly circles. So I'm a big advocate calling it the Gulen movement. And uh, Mohammed Chet, uh, uh, Dr. Chet uh, is a friend of mine. A lot of us know him. He was here in Houston for a while. He told me recently that he, he knows Mr. Gulen quite well. He was chatting with him. And they got to this issue about his myth. And Mr. Gulen said, I, I think Dr. Ebal is right. He said, I don't really think it bothers me because it's it puts a lot of emphasis on me, but he said, I, I think we're going to have to get used to it. So anyway, <laughs> uh, but okay, so as I look at these different places, who are the carriers of the movement? They're really, they're really four things I'm looking at. Then I'm going to talk about the edited book I'm now working on, which I'm very excited about. We talk about ten variables there, but I'll focus on four. What do you have to look at when you look at global movements. One of the big issues are the carriers. Who brings the movement? This varies very much in these countries. In, um, for example, in Azerbaijan, it was a local was a Turkish businessman who came from Turkey and introduced the movement to Azerbaijan. Now, somewhere like um, in other countries, it's businessmen. It's local businessmen who come into the country and meet with the local people and talk about the needs of that place. And he, there's local involvement, so it becomes a community-based kind of movement. And in some of these countries, that's how it happens. Part of the problem with a place like London and <coughs> Spain is that there aren't a whole lot of wealthy Turkish businessmen like in London. They have one school, it has 90 students, it's almost totally Turkish. Uh, they, they're having, the, most of the Turkish businessmen in London um, sell kebabs, they're little small uh, store owners, and they don't have a lot of money to invest. Spain has no schools. 40 people have started this dialogue society. They can't get money for the first school because there aren't a lot of businessmen in Spain with money. And most of these places don't depend heavily on support from Turkish businessmen. They might somewhat, at least in the beginning, but most of them depend on the local area. So uh, the carriers make a big difference. In Melbourne, um, Mr. Orhan, Shashek came in the late 70s, and he, he, there was nobody in Melbourne who even heard of the movement. But in, and there were a lot of um, blue-collar workers coming in from, from uh, Turkey. And finally, in the late 70s, he started a group that began to meet. He said there were six or eight people in the beginning, and they began to meet in a small group. 
And then he said in the early 90s, more wealthy Turks came to Spain. And at that point, they were able to generate more resources, and they built her school in 1997. And now I think they have nine or 10 uh, in, in uh, Australia. So one of the big things is the carrier. Whether it's businessmen who come in and you know get with, get with the local community, or whether it's Turks who live there and over time get the resources to really uh, generate the movement. Second thing that's very important, of course, um, are finances. You know, how do they generate finances? And in all cases, it's basically the local community. So what matters so much is the wealth of the people from Turkey who are coming into these various places and the kind of resources they're able to bring in. Um, thirdly, I've talked a little bit about communication networks. That is just critical. You know, we want to look at to what extent people in the movement communicate with each other, since there's no central headquarters that's sending out a newsletter or anything. So much of this communication is informal. And then finally, how the movement is changing. And it's changing. Um, I mentioned this notion of what it's going to be called. There's another way it's changing. Um, I didn't have a chance to talk about this earlier, but I'm convinced that the heart of this movement are the SOHPETs, S-O-H-P-E-T. It means the local circles. I think that's the pulse of the movement. It's, um, I don't know, six, eight, ten people who come together once or twice a week, sometimes based on where they live, sometimes based on their profession. They're women's sofets and men's sofets. They come together and they uh, talk about interpretations of the Quran. They talk about writings of Mr. Gulen. Um, they talk about projects that need funding. I keep saying, how do you know where to put your money? And they all say, well, people come to the sofets and they say, you know, this school needs 40 deaths. Can we help them? Uh, or this student you know, wants to live in the dormitory but can't afford it. So that's the heart of the movement. Now, if the movement is going to become less Turkish, if it's going to spread globally, and if it's going to invite more community, more non-Turks into the movement, <coughs> um, these sokbets, all that I've been to, are in Turkish. Um, and consists of people in the movement who speak Turkish. It's going to have to open up those sokbets if it really wants to become more non-Turkish and really uh, incorporate more people. A very interesting experience I had in Ankara last year. I spoke to, I think there were a thousand university students in this auditorium. Of course, I felt very comfortable. I felt like I was at home. I teach at the university. Anyway, it was wonderful because um, we talked about all kinds of things. And at the end, they asked me, Dr. Ebon, you know, what, what, what do you see as the future of the movement? What do we need to do? And um, I talked about this so fast. I said, you know, you're going to have to figure out about how to open up these sofets so that more people can participate and get the spirit of the movement. You won't believe how many emails I've got from university students. They told me that day, they said, that's what we're going to do. We're, I'm going to this university and I'm going to that university. We're going to build a mob for these sofets. So we'll see. But that's going to be very interesting. And of course, another issue, which all of you know I talk about a lot, is the role of women. And this is something I haven't totally worked out yet. It's different in every country. When, as those of you that have or will read the book, it's one of the criticisms I have. The movement in Houston is very much um, a male movement in terms of the public face. Now what you learn in a hurry is the women are very active, but you don't see them at the Ramadan dinners, they're not MCs, you don't see them much. 
one of these days we're going to have an iftar where there's going to be a man and a veiled woman MC in it. I'm waiting. <laughs> and not the anchor from Channel 2 TV. That doesn't count. She's not <laughs> part of the movement. I want to see a person from the movement in a veil. MC. And there's so many great women in the movement now who could easily do that. When I talk sometimes, it's really interesting. I'll have these. Uh, Sometimes there are young girls in the audience, high school or whatever. I've had this happen to me three or four times. They'll come up and whisper in my ear, Dr. Ebo, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. I want to be able to talk in front of a crowd. <laughs> so things are going to change. Watch out, these young daughters coming up. They're going to they're gonna make some changes. But in terms of women, it varies. Uh, Melbourne, women are very public. Uh, you see as many women leading interfaith things as you do men. And by the way now, in addition to education, another big emphasis is interfaith, intercultural dialogue. That's usually what happens first in a country. Is dialogue centers get established. And then, later, come the other things. In uh, Brussels is the Golden Rose, a group of women who have leased this beautiful building and they run seminars and symposia. And a lot of EU members, parliament members, come and seek out their help to talk about women in Islam or whatever. Uh, so it's changing. And I think one of the reasons, and what I'm saying and the work I'm doing now is, so much depends on the um, age of the movement in an area. In a place like Houston, we've only had the movement 10 years. 12 maybe, when I first met Mohammed. Chetan, he had brought the movement to Houston from Austin, IID, Institute of Integrated Dialogue. But that's recent. And a lot of people in the movement follow, have followed their husbands as workers or as uh, per, you know professional workers or as students. And many of them don't know English. And many are in childbearing years. They're so busy. They don't have time to learn English. So I think language is a big part. And the <coughs> part of it is culture. Um, and that's, you know, who says women have to be public? I mean, that's really a Western notion. <laughs> it may just be. I mean, part of Turkish culture I'm learning is that sometimes women just, I don't know if any of you were in that Amsterdam and that, uh, uh, LSE conference we had in Amsterdam. They asked me at the end of the conference, what do you see for the future? And I said something about, you know, women. <laughs> this veiled woman in the audience said, Dr. Ebal, I am so sick and tired of Western women like you coming over here and telling us what we ought to do. Mm -hmm. She said, I would much rather be at home cooking dinner and with my kids. And she made me think because I thought we do have assumptions. So I've been rethinking this thing about women as I go around the world. Okay, now let me say a little bit about what we're doing. I'm really excited about it. It's an edited book, probably going to be published by Ashgate. Uh, Stephen Cherry, a colleague of mine at U of H, Kierlake, and I are editing this book. We have nine case studies, including they're all religious, they're all service movements rooted in religious traditions. We have Soka Gagai from Japan. We have uh, Kawa Gilingwa uh, from uh, the Philippines. We have San Egidio from Italy, a very conservative Catholic movement out of Italy. We have, uh, oh Lord, I even forget all of them. It's just wonderful. We have, uh, well, I'll tell you some more. We have Swami Narayan, Hindu. We have the redeemed Christian Church of God out of Africa. We have Baha'is, the Ismaili Muslims, a, a Suchi Buddhist group, and then I'm doing the chapter on the Gulen group. All these authors are writing around 10 variables that the theory predicts are important for global movements. And then we're going to ask, what are the similarities between these movements? And what are the differences? That's another reason why I object to the word hismet. It means service. 
Every one of these movements does service. Volunteer, another the movement is sometimes called volunteers. Every movement is based on volunteers. So that does not differentiate the Gulen movement. One of the things that is very characteristic of the Gulen movement is its network society, its network of organization. Many of these groups are bureaucratically structured. That's one of the differences. Now, there's something else, but I, I can't answer this. You can help me with it. There's also a lot of cultural differences. And I'm just trying to get my head around this. You can tell a Gulen person wherever you see him. Um, I was in Azerbaijan <laughs> for a week. Didn't see any Gulen people. We were with ministers and political people. This, this Gulen person from the school was supposed to come pick me up at the hotel. It was about 1 o'clock and I was sitting in the lobby. And he walked through the door. I knew immediately that he was my contact. You can spot them. Now, I'm trying to articulate how you know them. Part of it is dress. Everywhere I lecture, it's the same model. And I'll tell you the model. Smile. Yeah, there is a smile. But I get there, and you go to a lounge, and they serve uh, tea, hot tea, and wonderful desserts. Then when everybody's in the audience, all seated, you walk in and are introduced. They would never, you know, I never mingle with the crowd before I start talking. It's very formalized. And then afterwards, there's always a thank you and a gift. And then you go back to the lounge and have hot tea and dessert. It's just a minor little thing. But everywhere, I don't care where you go, that's the model. They all do a, many of the same things in terms of interfaith, intercultural dialogue, in terms of education, in terms of even the summer camps. So I'm trying to articulate, but every one of these groups has its culture. So I'm trying to, and we're just starting this project, but chapters are just coming in. But that's something I'm really excited about this book because we're trying to develop a model <coughs> of how to study movements globally. OK, I'm going to stop there and see if you had any questions, comments. You mentioned it was interfaith. What are the, what is the uh, uh, student faith demographic uh, in terms of students? What are, what are their faiths? Oh, you mean like in the schools? In the schools. Uh, and in different every, countries, obviously. Definitely not majority Muslim. And also not majority Turkish. In some of these schools, you might have, I don't know, four or five students who are Turkish. Most of the teachers aren't Turkish. And the students come from all uh, religious backgrounds. Is there any data by country or anything like that on that subject? Or? Well, uh, there's no data, period. But I can tell you that it depends on the makeup of the country. If you're in an, a, a Muslim country, like, of course, in Turkey, most of the students are, are Muslim just because 97% of the population is. But they do have Christians and Jews. There's no exclusion on the basis of religion. You know, one of the, uh, I can't say a whole lot about the schools in Texas. You know, there are, what, 33 of them now? They're growing all the time. It's hard to keep up with them. You might know them as the Harmony Schools. And there have been some controversies. But so I have not done a systematic study of them. I have not been in a Harmony School, but I can, you know, I've talked to various people, including uh, Sunger, who's the principal of the schools, uh, or what do you call it, uh, superintendent. Um, they don't teach Islam. Some of these articles that have come out, like in the New York Times, they're just absolutely incorrect. That's all I can say, plain incorrect. There's no Islam taught. They, they follow the public school curriculum. Um, I understand that there are now about 29,000 families in Texas waiting to get into these schools. Most of the parents don't even know that they're connected to the Gulen movement. And they're really not. They're not Gulen schools. 
um, the way they're connected is basically, and the New York Times never pointed this out, you know, all, they're char a charter school. And all the charter schools are inspired by somebody. Even like the Catholic schools are inspired by, you know, Teresa of Avila or uh, St. Uh, Loyola, somebody. Many of the schools are inspired by Martin Luther King or the Dalai Lama or uh, William James or Dewey. So the way I heard the superintendent explain it is, there was a group of students at A&M, uh, doctoral students, and they noticed what shambles our education system is in, our public education. And they thought, you know, we have a model in Turkey that has been very successful. So they applied for charter school status, and I think it took them two years. And there was something like 200 schools that applied, but phenomenal number. And there were, I don't know, three or four that were granted the status. So they were vetted like you wouldn't believe when they were given the charter. And they're very much supported by the um, Texas uh, Department of Education. Anyway, um, so they were, this schools you know, originally were inspired by the philosophy of Mr. Lamb. But other than that, they really have no connection to them. So the teachers also from you know all faiths and all countries, they try to get the best they can. Now there are there part of this criticism was that you know they're giving favor to Turkish teachers. Well that's true and it's not true. You've got to find teachers who really can teach math and science. But sometimes that's hard to find in this country. Okay, so a big waiting list to get in. Yeah. Dr. Eva, you just mentioned a word I was curious about, and that's the philosophy. Have you spoken with some of your colleagues in philosophy on how we can apply any of this movement to post-modernity? And are there relations at all in the way this networking is happening or uh, and then is there anything to look at with the web way of thinking or the foundation of thinking as opposed to the modernity foundationalism what well, do let, philosophers think about let me this? just say in terms of uh, uh, media I mean, posters and I've never seen a group that does anything so professional I had the Indian Studies program come to me recently, and they were going to do a lecture. Maybe some of you were there with Bergesi, this famous author, and they wanted to advertise the uh, Indian Studies initiative at U of H. And you should see the poster they had, homemade on a mimeograph machine. I said, no, no, no. I said, you go over to the Gulen Institute, and you see what they do. I said, the first thing you do is you have really professional, top of the line, media posters and stuff. And I said, when he gives that talk, you have one that's about 10 feet high, and you put it behind the speaker, advertising religious studies. Uh, so media and, and uh, um, social media, uh, websites and whatever they're great at. But I wanted to address that in another way. When I was in London last year, we visited with a number of people in uh, the party and a person in the House of Lords. And they were very interested in the Gulen group. But here's why they were interested. Remember President Cameron had just started his uh, campaign to promote volunteerism, especially in the, on the community level, because he was going to reduce all these social welfare programs. So they wanted to know, is there a model? Uh, these people seem to be good community organizers. What can we learn from them? Well, I don't have this yet. I have to talk to Saeed. They were here about 10 days ago, and they have developed a 10-step model for community organizing. At the time, it was in just uh, draft format, but we passed that around to some of these people, and they were very interested in using it uh, for community development. When I was in Brussels, 
Brussels has a dialogue society that, whose purpose is to coordinate with the EU and the European Commission. So we spent time in the EU, and it was amazing. This book had just started to come out. I was carrying it, and members of parliament, three or four of them, came out in the hallway, and they said, Dr. Yvonne, I have that book. Uh, I want to ask you something. And usually they would ask me, they would call me to the side. They didn't want the Gulen people to hear this. And they would say, could that teach us anything about getting along with the Islamic world? Is that a group we could work with? And I said, yeah, I said, I think we could learn a lot from them. Because of their emphasis on intercultural and interfaith work. So this book was finding its way through the EU as a, I call it, moderate Islamic movement. Now, a lot of people in the movement don't like that word because it sounds like I'm watering down Islam. But in the Western world, what else are you going to say to compare it with some of these very radical Islamic movements? Remember, the book was really uh, inspired after 9-11 when people didn't know a thing about Islam. So to talk about moderate Islam was one way to get people's attention. This is not a radical group. It's a group that's promoting democracy and peace and whatever. So I think one of the things we have to learn is models of intercultural interfaith dialogue. And I don't know if any of you have been to the uh, Turquoise Center out on uh, Belford and uh, the uh, Belway 50, 8. 59. Since they started building the um, Peace Garden. They're going to have a Peace Garden. And they will have a church, a synagogue, and a mosque, all in this beautifully landscaped area. And uh, that's the whole idea, to promote conversation and dialogue and work together among these groups. So I think that's one thing we have to learn. This other thing we have to learn is education. You know these, this is, these are charter schools. And I'm, I'm a big believer in charter schools. And I'm a big believer in us learning from charter schools as models for what we ought to be introducing. You talk about postmodernism. We're a global world. We better educate our people. In, in 2030, we're going to be what? 35% Hispanic? Hispanics have a 50% dropout rate in high school. We better educate or we're not going to have a viable democracy. So I think we need to look at these schools, as well as KIPP and the Yes Academy and various of these charter schools, as models for how to improve education. So there's a lot Thank to learn. Do you want to uh, say anything about the, the controversial part or the polarized opinions about the movie? Oh, I should. The, the appendix to this book. Uh, we inter it talks about uh, the critics. This is a movement that's very controversial. Um, we interviewed 25 of these vocal critics in Turkey and about seven here in Houston. Oh my, I was at a party with my husband a few weeks ago and uh, a Turkish man and his woman walked in, a quite educated doctor. I won't say his name because you would know him. And, uh, Albert made the mistake of telling him I wrote this Gulen book. Oh my. He sought me out at this table, and for 20 minutes I knew. Here's how he started I am an Ataturk supporter. And then I knew I could write the speech because I've heard it so often. Um, there's a lot of criticism in Turkey and also in the United States, but I'm convinced that a lot of the criticism in the United States is a spillover from Turkey. They're arguing the same things here as they are in Turkey. And what they're afraid of are things like this. I outline, I think, seven in the book. But they go like this. It's the fear of Sharia, of an Islamic state. And they keep saying, what's really behind this movement? What are their clandestine, uh, hidden motives? And they know that they're a very wealthy, growing, powerful movement. So they're afraid of an Islamic state. And my response to them was, I'm sympathetic. You know, who wants a totally uh, 
Islamic State in the sense they mean Islamic. But I said, give me the evidence. Show me the data. Well, why do you think this is? Well, they didn't build trade in the police, and they didn't build trade in the uh, political structure. I said, show me. Give me a list. Well, of course, nobody could provide. Everybody knows that. I said, I don't. I would like to see the data. The same thing the other night with this film. Everybody knows that. I said, well, show me the data. He said, I'm a social scientist. I mean, I don't know anything until I see the data. Anyway, they're not interested in, in data. It's an ideological position. Uh, that's one thing they're nervous about. They're nervous about the fact that it's a movement of the elites. Well, in these schools, for example, I told you, in all these schools where I interviewed, at least 20% were on scholarship. Um, and also these schools in other parts of, well, even in Turkey to some extent, but in other parts of the world, they, they're located in these poor, poor areas. Um, they're worried about who's funding the movement. Well, we already talked about that. They're worried about women. Oh, you know, they just suppress women. They make women wear these veils. And on and on and on. So there, there are fears. But the, my conclusion is, that a lot of their fears are based on history in Turkey. Oh, it's so complicated. And uh, they're based on ideology, irrational fears. And many of the critics are reading the same newspapers. Jun Huriyet is one of them. They all read, and that newspaper is quite against the movement. So, and many of them, um, almost 50%, knew nobody in the movement. They didn't know anybody. So it's, it's kind of, you know, supporting the ideas of one another. So I would have naively assumed that there'd be criticism from more of the radical or conservative side. You're saying that in education, very little time is spent on religious education. It, you don't hear important. quite as much of that. I'm <coughs> sure there's some of that too, especially on the part of more, of more conservative movement. But you don't hear a lot of that. Most of these critics, you have to remember that, you know, the history of Turkey, when Adam Turk, you know, really separated religion from the state, or that was supposedly, I was amazed to learn the difference between the separation of church and state in Turkey and the United States. You know, in Turkey, they have this system which they call laicite, which Ataturk really learned in France. And there, the, you know, the state controls religion because they're afraid of religion. So they close the, a lot of the mosques, they close the schools where they train imams because they were afraid that they were going to be, uh, you know, hotbeds of radicalism, uh, religious radicalism. So it, it was, it's amazing. Do you know to this day all the mosques in Turkey are owned by the state? And the state publishes suggestions for the imams, what should be preached on Friday. So, I mean, it's incredible. So what I hear from a lot of these Gulen folks is, oh, we would love to have the system you have in the states where people can practice what they want. They're not advocating that any one religion be dominated, but they want an atmosphere where people can practice religion however they might see it. So, so um, talking about this worldwide movement with Gulan inspired schools, so what is it without a hierarchy or um, a reporting body or what does it mean to be a Gulen-inspired school? Well, that's a very good question, and a big question. What it basically means is that the people who set up the schools, who conceptualize them, and usually who put up the money for them, are low in places like Australia. The state builds these schools. Um, they're inspired by people in the movement who are inspired by Mr. Gulen's ideas of education. Emphasis on science and math and technology and human values. That's a big one. So that's really what it means. And you use the word Gulen inspired, which is what I use in the book, because there are no followers, there are no supporters, there are no membership lists. <clears throat> so it's inspired by the ideas of this. But a lot of people who are in these schools 
don't even know that they're connected to the land. And you wouldn't know that being in the school, really. There are no pictures of Mr. Gouland. There are no. So how do you find out that they're inspired by Mr. Gouland? By like, interviewing. By sorry. interviewing regarding the history of the schools. Okay. They're started by people who are inspired by his ideas. And is there any sense of, um, I mean, this is a new movement, so are there people who say, no, you're not Gulan enough? Or I'm more Gulan than you are? Or, I mean, you know, without a, I'm just trying to get my head around, yeah. without these tenants in place, yeah. how can you call yourself a Gulan inspired? Well, <coughs> I don't hear them fighting over that. Now, some of them, uh, you know, have met Mr. Gulan. <clears throat> I think of it this way. I think of the, it's a, it's a network society, but I think of it kind of like a group of concentric circles. There's kind of a group, uh, and these uh, businessmen we met in Istanbul would be part of them, who you know, knew Mr. Gulan from the beginning. His doctor that I interviewed in outside of Istanbul, close to Fadi University, he had a, oh, he took us down to the basement where he has a museum of Mr. Gulan's things, like the Quran that he gave them when they got married and things like that. So there's a group who kind of started out with him, who were his early, early, supporters and whatever. Uh, but then there's a circle that, you know, may have met him once or twice, know some of these people who are good friends of his. And they really, they read his works a lot. He's published a lot. I don't know how many books, 90 or something? I forget the latest count. And he has, he's always, uh, his sermons and homilies and whatever are on the internet. So people read him. So that's kind of how they share the philosophy. And then they talk about him in the so bets. Then there's a group who, you know, come and go, who participate in some of the activities of the movement, but aren't really of course. I just have a, a general question about um, the schools as a charter and charter schools in general. Um, is there any uh, addressing of special needs students within the Gulan schools or so, you know, what you kind of see with the charter schools is it's self-selecting. So you get the best and you get parents who are motivated, and if they're not motivated anymore, they're, they're taken out of the school. So, of course, you're going to have a great outcome, right? I so. can't speak a lot for the schools in Houston because I haven't, you know, studied those schools in Korea. I'm sure some of the people here can. who are familiar with them. But I can talk about in other countries, like in uh, Australia. The government builds the private schools, and then they become self-supporting. But then they can apply for grants from the government, and the government helps them through these grants. And I know, like in Melbourne, they do have programs <coughs> for uh, the disadvantaged, for the physically disabled, for the mentally challenged. So uh, I, I don't know if they do in the Harmony schools. I, 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 do any of you know help? Do they have? Uh, well, none of my sons go to one of those campuses. And as far as I know, they are no different from other public schools. Uh, if, they, if the school is, has enough resources, they provide a number of teachers. Uh, they are required to uh, but by the state to provide to those services. Yeah. They are no different from other schools. I think they have to be in charters. I know Yes Academy and KIPP has to have programs. Right, as far as ADA and stuff, yeah. it's more about, um, my question is about behavior kind of stuff, yeah. and then parent involvement, and it's like a KIPP Academy, you apply, there's only oh, so many apply. slots, and you know, it's competitive. You so apply kind of to these schools, schools, and you have to meet a certain requirement. Uh, Although many of them are in these disadvantaged areas. I don't know in the Harmony schools, they, but they, I, like I say, I haven't the majority, as far as I know, the majority are uh, meals uh, on the meals program, so they need financial assistance. Yeah. Because most of these schools in Texas are in very, very uh, uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods. Right. So you have they families who are interested in education who are applying, is what I'm saying. I, and then that leaves maybe the families who aren't as supportive for the public yes, schools. Yes, that's, that's right. It's a more difficult situation that's in exactly the end right. for the public schools. In that sense, they are self-selected. 
That's right. I would agree with that. Um, and don't forget that once the, the parents have to make a, a, a sort of a commitment right. too, that they'll be involved and they get visited by the teachers. So to that extent, there's not only self-selectivity, but there's you know, working with the parents. I was in that breakfast with my daughter about a year, a year and a half ago, and Soner called me. I was going to go visit one of the schools, and he called me to cancel the appointment. And I mentioned Harmony School. This lady at the next table, when I hung up, she came over and she says, Do you know about Harmony Schools? And I said, Well, a little bit. She said, I want to get my child into one so badly. Can you pull strings for me? <laughs> so it's becoming a quite well known issue. I thought your question was very good. Uh, is there a blue line book that you recommend that contains the principles that he expounds in terms of um, what makes a Gulan school? Uh, I don't know that there's a book on the schools per se. Or on the movement. Not that I know of. The movement, well, yeah. There's plenty on the movement. There's two up there. <laughs> this there's one. one. <laughs> yeah. But there's some more. Um, by Gulan himself. Oh, yeah, yes. Now, there are a lot of books by Mr. Gulan. Um, Any particular? Book? I find them hard to read. You know, they're, they're translated. Well, if they're in Turkish, I would have made it for me. Yeah, yeah, but they're interpreted. I mean, so you can get interpretations. Okay. But I keep thinking that it's not as valuable for us to read Mr. Gulen himself as it is some of the um, explanations of the Gulen movement. And there are some good ones. Um, Dr. Aslan edited a book with um, Hunt. What's the name of it? The, uh, uh, Muslim citizens of the globalized world. Muslims in the globalized world. It's excellent. It's a it's a group of essays. I think they, it came out of the Rice Conference. Uh, from the Dallas Conference, plus but some from others. There, there. These Gulen. Uh, there are a number of Gulen conferences that you know draw academics. But that's a very good book to get a a, a feel for the movement. Mohammed Chetan has one, but it's hard to read now. Unless you're really a social. Well, certainly your book. <laughs> <laughs> it's very simple. I mean, I wrote this book for a Western audience. It's very simple. Um, I'm simple I, from the Western movement, so that should be no problem. <laughs> I wanted to do a book just on the finances. And when I shopped my prospectus at our national meeting, with you know Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and whatever, they all told me the same thing. Dr. Ebal, new land? Who's that? We need a book first introducing this movement uh, before you do anything specifically on finance. So that's I had to come back and rewrite my prospectus, and that's kind of so it's very basic. Uh, it places the movement in the Turkish context. There's a very short chapter on Turkish history and some of the concepts of Islam that motivate people in the so. no, oh, One of the questions that always intrigues me about religions is that uh, the Episcopal Church has a membership list of who belongs to the Episcopal Church. The Catholics have one, the Mormons have one, and, 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 and when you talk about network, I always get confused about what is what is the difference between what how they promote their ideas and how, how those of individuals who've been in the Episcopal Church in the United States since this country was founded. Well, I, that's a good question, and I would say that you know organizations <coughs> like the Episcopal Church and the Catholic Church they have a lot of. Um, um, not only books on it, but they have uh, lists. They have, you know, you can tell. You can have a membership list at Christchurch Cathedral or whatever. You know who belongs. And they tithe. But often they tithe by, you know, stewardship meetings and the pastor getting up and saying, you know, everybody makes you feel guilty about it. <laughs> and, and they have a membership list where they can send you things. Um, the, and, and by the way, this network idea, 
even though it drives social scientists crazy because it's very difficult to get numbers. I think it's one of the strengths of the movement. And I think it's one way the movement is going to become increasingly strong globally because it's so net, not only networked, but it's very local. It looks different to some extent in different locales because it tries to meet the needs of that particular locale. And it, it, it aims to have people in a locale buy into it. So it's not just something that's imposed from the top. It's something that has community support. And I think that's one of the strengths of it. I think this movement, is, it, it really is, it's growing so rapidly all over. And I think it will continue to. Um, and I think one of the reasons is the community it builds. A lot of people are looking for community. And that's why these self bets are so important. And you know, there were a lot of people that I've interviewed everywhere. They will say, you know, don't interfere with my two self bets during the week. And businessmen, there's a uh, association of businessmen in, with headquarters in Istanbul. And they'll, those businessmen would tell me over and over again, um, you know, I have board meetings and corporate meetings and whatever, but my rule is don't interfere with Monday and Thursday nights because that's my self bet. I mean, they're so committed. That's their family. And I think that's, that's part of this network society. One of the things we're learning and all these groups we're studying, you know one of the strengths of these movements? Local circles. All of them. Whether it's Hindu, whether it's Buddhist, whether it's conservative, Catholic, whatever. If you want to build commitment, you have to have these local circles. So that's not unique to the Gulen movement. That's very common across these religious movements. Well, my impression with the small focus that I had when I was introduced to a number of these people, both in Houston and in, uh, in Turkey, was that what set them apart was they appeared individually to be inspired. They're inspirited. And so the quickest way to kill that is to organize it join it and have a list, <laughs> you know, so then you become something else. It's, uh, I, I, that's what I see, it's, it, I never met anyone who wasn't vitalized, who wasn't uh, inspirited, I mean, and, uh -huh. and that is, that's from the individual that then spreads outward, rather than from the organization that promotes it. Right. You know, I really first met the or one of my first experiences with his graduate students came from Turkey, two of them. You know, we would work 40, 50 hours a week as graduate students. And they were spending 25 or 30 hours involved in this movement. And I would say, when do you sleep? I mean, what? Their commitment was just incredible. And that's what really first got me interested in it. What can motivate people this way? Right. That right. issue of motivation. And I think part of it is these small groups, because that's where the spirit gets generated. And I know women, uh, I've talked to a lot of women, and uh, that's just their lifeblood. You know, they're home with the kids all week and whatever. But all of those so that's that's their friends. And I think that's another thing we can learn in terms of postmodernism. You know, I don't care how big we get, I don't care how global and whatever. We've got to keep those, you know, those small groups, that sense of community. Well, thank you very much. This has been. Uh,